I've been thinking a lot about uh, the sort of the evolution of a man going his own way. And I think it might be helpful to spell out the process. Um, and one of the reasons I want to do this is because, like it or not, there definitely is a rift between MRAs and men, men who are concern, concerned with men's issues who still advocate relationships, traditional or otherwise, and marriage, still advocate the idea that there's so many, so many fish out there in the sea that you, you're probably going to find a good one eventually, or you might not, but there's still some good ones. And the men who really have taken a stand and go their own way. I think we all go through various stages on our way to becoming men going their own way. It's not a clear-cut thing. Um, and it's a process that can, in some ways, be, um, be indefinite in, time, in terms of the, the time span. Some, by some, some people it happens very quickly, and others it doesn't. Some people are in the middle. But one thing, I think the initial spark is, let's be honest, it is a kind of disappointment. That's the initial spark. It's not the first failed relationship, the first failed encounter with a woman. It's that repeated, it's, it's the repetition thereafter. And then you start wondering, hmm, is there something up? To complement that from the outside, you start reading, maybe not reading, who reads women's magazines, or looking at the covers, or hearing stories, or watching, watching telly, or whatever. And you just you start hearing things that you will now, in your current state of, of a man going his own way, identify as being deeply misandric. But it's very subtle sometimes, or it's not subtle anymore to us, but it used to be. Is he fulfilling your needs? Dozens of these sorts of, sorts of articles. I was re-watching a Girl Writes What's video today, and she mentioned, I thought she was just pulling out of her ass, to be honest. She's like, uh, that's why she says on the effect. That's why these days you can get articles such as "Do Vancouver men suck?" So I, did, I literally googled that phrase, and lo and behold, I found an article, five pages long, by some wench full of herself, describing why Vancouver men suck. So it actually was an article. But you start picking up on stuff like that. You really do, and you start noticing it all, and you just start scratching your head. This is really weird. Um. And I've lived the majority of my adult life in Europe, so you know, I, I, and I lived in the, originally from the states, and so I kind of, I would say, a mixed perspective. But I've seen a lot of different sides to these things, and it's just as bad here as it is there. It's it's basically a global phenomenon, at least in the West. It's a global Western phenomenon, and so you just think, this is just screwy. What's wrong with it? There's something wrong with the picture here. Then you add it to your experiences with your relationships. And it just becomes very, very, very strange that there seem to be too many coincidences. And the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. And what initially was a grand puzzle seems to make sense. It's not a conspiracy, but there is something malevolent, for lack of a better word, behind it all. There's something going on. Something about maybe female mentality? Hmm, what's going on here? And you might start reading up about feminism and, and what, is, what is actually done. Um, I mean, feminism with a capital F, not the inherent feminism that I, I would suggest exists within females. And that really gets you wondering. At some point in time, in that synthesis of thought, of these many, many thoughts you have, you, 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 it all comes together, and then you just you realize that something truly is amiss. When you realize something truly is amiss, I think what happens to many of us, and I'm no exception, there's no reason to be ashamed of it, you enter a period of mourning. When you realize that relationships, love, all of these things have essentially been mythology, uh, adult mythology, not, well, ch children's mythology as well. I mean, we, we, we children are indoctrinated with this stuff as well. In fact, that's that's how we got it in the first place. And later on in adult years, you notice that, that this has all been a fairy tale. The stuff you've been fed has been a fairy tale. You do enter into a period of mourning. It's, it's the recognition, as I've said many times, that of your own disposability, of, of your, 
your actual value is merely that of an appliance as a utility, something to be either used if it's useful or not, to, or not in the case of not being useful, to be discarded. Um, that can be a rather lengthy period. And after that, once you get over that, I believe, this period of mourning, you attain something else, which is freedom. Freedom, ultimately, is what I'm advocating, what I think is the best solution to all of this. Um, if, you, if you're not beholden to the clutches of a woman, you have a lot more freedom, financially, personally, in virtually every respect. And whilst many articles are published on the benefits of partnership for your health, um, I doubt that guy, that guy in the Denver jail that we heard about recently is doing quite very well health-wise. And I'm sure he was, he was with his wife for quite some time before she decided to throw him away like a piece of trash. So you get past the morning, and you just have a kind of a clarity. And you also have a sense of freedom, a newfound sense of freedom, that... You just don't give a shit anymore. And that's lovely. Um, when I used to, I am rambling here, but when I used to care about what women thought, when I used to have take a direct interest in women, I would pay attention to whether I was shaven or not and how I was dressing. I just don't care anymore. In fact, the less attention I get from women, the better. And those are the stages you go through. It's, it's realizing something is amiss based on your own experiences. Absorbing information from the environment uh, based on observation, reading, listening, discussion with male friends, recognizing that there's a common pattern here, identifying that pattern. And then finally, something clicks into place. For me, for me, ironically enough, this is a guy who still pursues, but a friend of mine I haven't spoken to for quite some time. He once said to me, the only thing that can break a man is a woman. I think that was the key to me, for me to realizing the truth about all of this. A man who still clings to the idea that a relationship with a female in today's climate is feasible, um, obviously is still in, the, in, the, in one of those stages or in processing something, in my opinion. He's not quite there yet. And as Bob Russell said, he so desperately wants to believe it's possible. He so desperately seeks that companionship. And this leads me to another point, which I want to address at some length. One of my viewers asked me, why do I keep on calling it an addiction? Our attraction to women. Why is it an addiction? Hmm. Well, let's just say that an addiction doesn't need to be a traditional addiction, but an addiction is, to my mind, any sort of substance, or in this case, a person, that uh, can have a uh, highly negative and harmful influence on your well-being, uh, whether physically, mentally, or both. Um, and there's nothing wrong, as one of my, I think it was Save the Men, who, who poses with, who, with wanting to have companionship. Even now, uh, if I still subscribe to the fairy tale, I would like to have female companionship, but the important thing is to put everything in its proper perspective. You cannot live in an unreality. You cannot live in a fairy tale. As much as we want to live in a fairy tale, you know, sometimes I'll close my eyes. I'm not going to lie. I have my weaknesses. I have lots of weaknesses. And I sit back and I think, wouldn't it be nice if, or I'll reveal even more, even now, in my current state of mind, I will think back to my last ex and the illusion of this night. I remember I took her to the ballet and it just seemed, everything seemed so fine and so nice and so perfect and she really seemed to care about me. Of course, it was all an illusion. But for a couple of moments, I'll fall back and that'd be all of our weaknesses. But the important thing is that in the majority of the time you live in reality and that you don't succumb to fairy tales. That's the important thing. Is engaging in a relationship with the modern female a harmful habit? I would say it is. By all objective evidence, it's very clearly a very harmful habit. Hence, my characterization of that as an addiction. Quite simply, that's why I call it an addiction. Um, and I think if it's a harmful habit, you know, one one best one should best kick that habit. Uh, it's simply not viable anymore.
you need to start something new, start something start with something fresh. I've often spoken of the analogy of the phoenix rising from the ashes. I, I make uh, no secret of the fact that I advocate a total dissolution of the current social, social structures, not an anarchy, but at least traditional relationship structures in order to find something new if it's feasible at all. Not trying to make something that's been, that is so severely broken and so uh, irrevocably so and so severely in need of repairs that, that it's just a complete waste of time trying to make those repairs. Um, there's a reason why the car was scrapped. Um, it wasn't working anymore. So we need to make a new automobile that maybe with a better engine, maybe with an, an, a hydro engine that runs on uh, through, through purely hydraulic power, anything. But well, that's just an idea I'm throwing out here. But the idea here is simply that we can't just stay with the old model. Men who want to continue with the old model, tradi traditionalists or otherwise, um, are clinging to something that no longer works. And I think, and I'm sympathetic to their level of desperation because we all yearn for companionship as men with females. That's what we want. That's one of the reasons why recently I've been uh, posting a glut of images on my videos of highly attractive Asian, specifically Korean women. That was my own, or I suppose is my weakness. I find them extremely attractive. But to know, to recognize that behind that beauty lurks a demon essentially a demon, or at the very least, a person that you do not really want to associate with uh, beyond perhaps a one-night stand. Um, that's why I, I post those images. Trying to resuscitate, uh, the final analogy, um, a person who's clinic, who, who clinically alive because his organs still work and his brain on some level works, but is non-responsive to anything. I mean, that just hooked up to a bunch of tubes. Uh, that's the modern relationship. That's the scrap heap. We need to let the person die. We need to end his suffering. Take off the tubes. Let the person go in peace. That's what we need to do with the relationship. The only way we're going to make progress is with total dissolution and, sorry to use the word, destruction of the old model because it's not working anymore. It simply is not. And, and men who think they can make it work uh, sooner or later, you're going to realize that you're just fooling yourself. Sorry to say, it's a bit harsh, but ultimately, you're going to realize you're just fooling yourself. And that going your own way, rather than being an alternative, probably is the only viable solution. Um, unless you want to keep on trying to put the scrap together and spending more and more money on that broken car rather than getting a completely new one. Just pull the plug, guys. Pull the plug. You'll be a lot better off for it um, because the relationship, like that patient who's alive, basically undead, you, you, the relationship is undead. Um, we need to, to, to kill the undead. The undead are unholy, right? And uh, we need to breathe new life into whatever that might be. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But uh, you know, the only way to do it is to deprive them of power. Boycott the product. Boycott, boycott women. Don't buy into it. That is the solution. If, if, if you're still searching, by all means, I'm not going to stop you. You want to do that. But I think ultimately we're all in that, we all engage in that process where we finally reach that synthesis and that epiphany, that aha moment. It's not going to work. On a final note, I know this is long. Some people don't like my rambling, but hey, this is my style. Those men who claim within a relationship say, oh, my relationship is great, and so on and so forth, uh, that it's working, or they, the woman actually cares for them, and so on and so forth. I've seen, I've seen men in real life uh, enjoy, quote-unquote, enjoy those sorts of relationships. When you actually observe, on closer inspection, how many concessions they make to their own personhood, their own uh, freedom, it's, it's rather alarming. And remember, uh, Another form of shaming language is to always couch things in terms of compromise. Ooh, you need to compromise. That's why you can't get a relationship, or that's why it won't work. You need to compromise. Compromise inevitably simply means that the man needs to sacrifice more of himself to obtain or to retain the favor of the female. That is a no-go. Um, talk about enlightened self-interest. Well, that's what, that's what ma a man going his own way is doing, is engaging in enlightened self-interest. 
uh, in my opinion. You'd all be the people who still advocate the relationships with women, however natural it might be. And I'm not, not look, I love women too. I mean, love. You either love women or you understand them. I, I desire women too, but the uh, simple fact is that uh, the car is broken, it's a, a scrap heap, forget about it. It's not going to work anymore. It's just done. And that's all I have to say. Thanks for watching. I'm starting to see some subtle and not so subtle ways in which we're being kind of encouraged to kind of stay quiet on the hypergamy issue. And uh, I'm just going to say right here and right now that uh, under no circumstances am I going to stop talking about hypergamy on this channel, uh, specifically in regards to the, um, to the issue of whether or not women outside of the West and, and in America uh, who haven't been groomed by 60 years of feminism have ever exhibited hypergamy. Uh, watch my video, Traditionalism, Nothing But Business in a Bottom Line, where I give numerous examples of highly patriarchal civilizations like India and China, which are thousands of years old, that had feminism entrenched itself in a single generation, that means 20 years or less, and the women are divorcing in the exact same ratio and quantities as their American and Western counterparts. Exact ratios. Now, I explain that away as learned behavior when it all unfolded in one-third the time that American feminism did. Uh, now. You know, I, I can personally attest that over the years I've had this channel, I've personally received what has had to be a few thousand emails telling me that this channel and others that put an emphasis on female nature uh, and, and even male nature, particularly in regards to what causes them to behave the way they do, females, in regards to men, uh, have completely changed their outlook on life for the better and how it was the missing piece that they needed to finally break out of the blue pill provider protector role. And so now people are suggesting that we should simply stop educating men on hypergamy in hopes that some women won't be alienated. Uh, under no circumstances is that going to happen. I mean, the ignorance of things like hypergamy and male disposability are what causes suicides after divorce. I mean, I, I can't even begin to express just how important it is to talk about these things, and I wouldn't stop even if every woman on planet Earth joined the men's movement tomorrow. Uh, I mean, this isn't an insult to women to say this, it's just a simple fact. Female nature must be understood and spelled out to men very clearly. The choices they make after that is up to them, but under no circumstances are we going to silence our description of it for a perpetual men's rights campaign. And, and really, you know, that, that's what it is, isn't it? You know, uh, this, this constantly having to check our tone and rhetoric and, and say things in just the right way because, you know, well, we, we, we don't want to sound like we hate women. Men going their own way are simply tired of walking on eggshells. You know, we, we crack them now. We crack them whenever they're in our path. I mean, we're just done. Absolutely done walking on eggshells. And our general mission, at least in this variant of men going their own way, is to get as many men to reject being a provider to women, a tax source for the state, and to start spending their time and hard-earned money for their benefit and enjoyment. Through this, we starve the system. It's just that simple. We want to starve the system because we, we believe the system, on some level, uh, is 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 irretrievably broken and I know that might sound apathetic to you uh, but keep in mind that during the collapse of Rome there were some people that didn't want to hear that Rome is collapsing so let, let's talk again then about alienating women the perpetual PR campaign approach puts an almost obsessive emphasis on not offending women as evidenced by the suggestion that we should only talk about hypergamy as, as briefly as possible or, or even not at all. Now, me and others have posted various videos in which we talk at length about male nature. Uh, I've discussed the male mothering need, uh, his need to believe in his own private Madonna, compelling men like Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods to marry. Uh, I've talked about man's uh, chivalrous nature and his propensity for minimizing his own utilization by women. Uh, notice though, and this is interesting, that nobody is suggesting that we stop talking about that However, I mean, notice that we can lambast men for being manginas and white knights and, and somehow nobody cares. I mean, nobody talks about how that's unnecessary and counterproductive because it'll alienate men. Uh, because you see, we actually hold men up to a standard of behavior. If they behave like simpering white knights, we point and say, look at the pathetic simpering white knights. And we could honestly care less about who gets offended by it. I mean, we, we don't worry about looking like a misandrist when we ridicule white knights. Yet we very much do worry about looking like a misogynist when we point out hypergamy. So, so it's not about alienating people here. It's about not alienating women. It's about 
this this hypersensitivity towards women that got us in the situation that we're in in the first place. Feminism uh, came partly out of this hypersensitivity towards women that we have within even the men's rights movement. You know, by the same logic, if I point out that that human nature shows us that we are a violent animal, a warlike species. Does that make me a misanthrope now? I mean, if, if, if I'm an advocate for basic human rights, should I pretend that we aren't a warlike species because it might alienate people? No, it's the truth. And I'm not going to cover it up to spare people's feelings. The proponent of the perpetual men's rights PR campaign suggests we self-censor uh, because quite simply he's a salesman. And he knows that customers that have an incentive to buy his product buy his product with very little persuasion from him. While those with no incentive to buy his product need to be sold. They need to be coaxed to buy his product. The question it all boils down to is incentives. Men have an incentive to join this movement because feminism and male disposability overwhelmingly target and harm men. Women don't because feminism and male disposability overwhelmingly benefit women. To say this might be abrasive or offensive to women, it might turn off some potential women looking to join the MRM, but it happens to be the truth. A truth that should not be covered up or ignored, but embraced and emphasized. If you as a woman aren't mature enough to understand these things, that's your problem, and the men's movement isn't going to perpetually soothe female hurt feelings when we could be devoting our time to much more productive endeavors. Now my honest opinion on, on the matter is that the men's rights movement will never uh, be able to incentivize women to join this cause in any capacity significant enough for it to gain any major benefit simply from the presence of women in our movement alone. In my opinion, the sheer number of women it would take for the general public to say to itself, uh, you know, look, it's obvious that the men's rights movement doesn't hate women because look at how many women have joined their ranks. It's just the number that we would need is just too high. It would have to be tens or even hundreds of thousands of women. Our numbers in men aren't even close to approaching that number. They've seen the damage that divorce can do to their sons and husbands, and I'd imagine they'd have to fight down an urge to bitch slap any person, male or female, that tells them, you know, don't worry about that. Don't worry about the fact that your son or husband is getting the crap divorced out of them because, well, you know, not all women are like that. They know not all women are like that, and, and yet enough of them are that now it's landed right on her doorstep. I mean, she's just not trying to hear it the same way we're not trying to hear it. I mean, she's seen enough of what we have seen as MRAs and men going their own way to know it's time to do some serious generalizing, and the exceptions will just have to walk it the fuck off and get over it. Yes, you've been generalized. You've been generalized out of necessity. Get over it. The point is that I have no problem with women in the men's movement at all, but I will not go out of my way to make them comfortable because I don't go out of my way to make men comfortable. I mean, if you like what's being said on this channel, you can subscribe. You don't? Well, go elsewhere. Part of the reason I stick to this channel and I don't claim any official affiliation with any other group in the manosphere is because I never want to be put in a situation where I can't say whatever I please for fear of compromising an attempt at giving the men's rights movement or anything else uh, in the manosphere a facelift. And it's, and it's appropriate, I think, to be clear and to say that I have no affiliation with any men's rights organization that believes we should not speak about hypergamy or male disposability or Brifolt's law or any other aspect of female nature, period. And quite frankly, I'm not even an MRA. I, I can't even hold that title anymore. Uh, and, and I'm not a, a non-feminist. You know, I don't believe feminism was this magical evil that descended from the mountains in the form of a cloud to infect Western civilization. I believe it simply to be an at best minimally socially engineered natural and organic eventuality that resulted from and is perpetuated by the peculiar natures of both the human male and female. My suggestion uh, to the men's rights movement going forward is that they focus not on a wasteful approach that revolves around showing the blue pill masses that we're not extremists or women haters. Uh, no matter how we say it, the blue pill masses will seek to characterize us as just that. I mean, I mean we saw this uh, when Jessica Valenti uh, despite the fact that no prominent MRAs have ever called for violence against women. Uh, we saw this when she tried to tie us in with the likes of George Soldini. Uh, the only reason that didn't stick is because he very clearly only had a minimal involvement with the PUA world. But believe me, they will find some way to label us extremists no matter what we say. Uh, my, my suggestion is to focus on targeted legal battles that can be changed. Not, not on convincing all of womankind that we don't hate them. You know, affirmative action for women, as an example. Pure discrimination against men and in violation of multiple constitutional amendments. Class action lawsuit waiting to happen. Let the women that want to join us do so. But let's devote our energy and time and money to suing these motherfuckers. I mean, it's time to start attacking these people. I want to fight. 
you know, I, I don't want to fucking dance around in a way that women feel safe and, and sound so that maybe, maybe, just maybe, sometime before a manned mission to Mars, we can start discussing the privileges that women have been unfairly extended at the expense of men. I want to fight these people now. Whether or not women feel comfortable with it, I want to fight them now. You know, class action lawsuits may be expensive, but relatively speaking, compared to the time and energy expended in showing the entire world that we don't hate women every second of every day, it's much cheaper. And, and we're fighting the actual legal issue at hand. Selective service, class action lawsuit waiting to happen. You know, I donate my time and money to that. Something that actually directly addresses the problem. And we, we don't need to recruit women for that. They can help us if they want. But if they choose not to, we don't need them to do this. You know, uh, and, 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 and you got to ask yourself, you know, is it important to you the reasons why these women are helping us? Is it important to you uh, that, that they're helping us for either of two reasons? A, they're altruistic and they want to help us and they really see a human rights violation. Or B, uh, you know, their son is getting divorced and now it's affecting them. I mean, these kind of things... They may not be important in in the long term, but they they certainly you know it certainly matters to some people. That's something that we should all think about. You know, what are you what are your uh, reasons for being here as a woman? Again, we all do things to validate our own incentives. So, I'm I'm not here to uh, tell women why they should or shouldn't be in the men's rights movement, but I'm I'm just saying that uh, in the meantime, we certainly are not going to stop talking about hypergamy or female nature or any of these things and if they offend you then maybe uh you know you should find somewhere else uh where where people are voluntarily self-censoring themselves uh so that you can be comfortable and not hear things that you don't want to hear Greetings. This isn't the video I've been scripting, but I wanted to take a little break and address a comment that was made on my most recent video about the women against feminism. Now, I can't seem to find the comment, so I'll paraphrase it, and the gentleman shall remain anonymous. It's, his name isn't important, but he basically made the statement to the effect of, yeah, he finds it fulfilling or uh, efficacious sometimes to argue with feminists because sometimes he wins and sometimes he cast doubt in their minds. That was the first part of it. And furthermore, he's on the fence as to whether or not saying the problem is female nature is perhaps bigoted or too biased or what have you. Okay. So I want to talk about this a little bit or extensively depending on how, uh, how it goes. The fundamental problem in addressing any issue of human nature, female or male, sexual or otherwise, is that if we limit ourselves to the present, if we are temporarily stuck where we are right now in modernity and we seek solutions there, we're not going to find many. We're not going to be able to deduce, at least on the most complex and perhaps deepest level, the, the ultimate cause and effect here. Everything comes down to cause and effect. We want to understand the effects, and to understand the effects, we have to understand the causes. I would argue that the fundamental problem is the uh, headless chicken running around. This is just another synonym for autopilot in a way, but uh, I'll give you a little analogy, and this is, this is it seems unrelated, but it's in fact related because this is what happens. And I was playing, uh, I play a shooter sometimes, a couple of weeks ago, a guy made a comment, you know, we need to stop running around the head, like headless chickens and strategize here. And that's what we were doing, just running around shooting, not thinking about our, how we were going about it, how we're going to beat the opposing team. Essentially, this is the same problem here. This is the autopilot. We're running, most people, most human beings are running around headless chickens. They're just going about their business. They're following their neurochemical, biochemical uh, drives and instincts. That's what they're doing. They're not thinking and putting a lot of thought into why they're doing these things. Now, to understand, to well, rather, to be able to overcome or change your biological inclinations, you're going to have to understand a lot of things that have almost nothing to do with the present. Most of them are going to have to do with uh, your ancestors that lived tens of thousands, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of years ago. 
And it's true that we don't have a complete understanding of that picture, but we have a rather good understanding these days of how our ancestors lived and, and the kinds of behaviors that they engaged in that produced and led up to the behaviors we engage in today. After all, these were effective strategies back in the day at that juncture in time, perhaps not so much now. But I ask you, um, the audience, how many people these days really engage in this sort of personal research? I'm not talking about academics, but people, I'm talking about people such as you know, myself, you, all y'all. How many people actually do this? Now, as much as I dislike the, the term red pill, blue pill, purple pill these days because it's just ubiquitous, rampant, and it's really lost its appeal to me, there is, you, you could uh, make a line of demarcation and say, well, may, maybe true red pill knowledge entails that. Maybe true red pill knowledge entails trying to understand these origins, these distal causes for our behavior. The point I'm trying to make here is quite simply that if you don't have the know-how to fix a car, you're not going to be able to fix it. To, to fix a car, and I don't know how to fix a car because I don't drive and I don't own a car. Well, there you go. So I, I would be fucked. I mean, I don't have a car, so it's not really a problem for me. But let's say I attempted to drive down the highway illegally and uh, you know, my car broke down. I would, I would have problems because I don't understand. I have some basic knowledge of how the, the motor works and the engine, but... I'm hardly a mechanic. I don't understand the origins of how that all works. Um, I don't have the experience and so on and so forth. The same applies to every field in, in life and every endeavor in life, more or less. And it's particularly true when it comes to these deep-seated biological urges and drives that we all experience. Now, I'm the kind of freakish guy, admittedly, who might sit in a cafe and observe people and observe myself and then actually think, well, you know, this ma male is doing that, and that female is doing that, or these two females are doing that. What is the operative principle here? Can I, can I imagine a prehistoric scenario that would lead to this sort of behavior? And, some, and often, actually, at times, I, I, I can do that. Most people don't do that. We, most people live in the here and now. They live in a proximate world. To truly understand these things, you need to live in the distal as well as the proximate world in terms of cause and effect. And quite frankly, uh, beyond a handful of MGTOW, and arguably not even every MGTOW, not every MGTOW is into, interested in evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology, uh, you're not going to have the know-how. And it's not for want of it being difficult. This isn't rocket science. We're not talking about quantum mechanics here. This is just you know, putting in the effort and having the interest in understanding these things. You're not going to have the know-how uh, to, to dissect these things, to dissect these problems. And so saying, well, yeah, people can overcome their nature, well, first they have to understand what their nature is and why they're doing it. It's highly doubtful that these women who are against feminism, for example, really have a vested interest in understanding their own nature, male nature, female nature, human nature, and totality. And you know, in, in the world at large, the few people who do, a couple of evolutionary bio, a handful of evolutionary biologists, psychologists, they're not really... They're not giving it up. They, they're interested in their, first off, they have their political correctness agenda that they have to pursue, which is a huge obstacle. It follows people, like, to us, to, to dissect these things on our own because we don't have a political correctness agenda. And as I said, these things are not difficult to understand. Understanding human evolutionary biology and psychology and behavior and what have you, and even the basics of uh, genetics not that difficult, say, compared to something such as, you know, quantum mechanics or, you know, aerodynamics or any of these, these th things that require a lot of mathematical know-how. Now, you also have to have the willingness. I mean, it's one thing, imagine if you're a woman, say, you know, I have this, this in a certain context, very damaging hypergamous nature. Uh, I tend to, you know, women, let's be honest, women are less loyal than men. We see this with the way they defect from their families. Uh, we've, see, we've seen this in, in the War Brides. Those of you who haven't seen my video on War Brides, go check it out. Uh, for quick, quick reference, these were women uh, across several different countries uh, during World War II who defected and slept with Nazi soldiers and had children with them. Anyway, so questioning that nature uh, is, an, is one step, and wanting to overcome it is another. Uh, w women, as I've said many times, have no good biological interest to seek the best uh, interests of a man, man because at best he is a what an optimal or a very useful tool. He's a utility that might have uh, great application potential, 
But beyond that, you know, utility tools can be replaced. You, you replace your your wrench, you replace your your vacuum cleaner. I mean, these are not. This is not difficult. Uh, it's it's going to be incredibly rare to have a woman think, hmm, yeah, we're living in a completely different era, and you know, my hypergamy really isn't serving me well, and it's hurting you know the men at large and the men in my life, and so on and so forth. I mean, this is. You might you might find the odd woman who's going to do that, and statistically, it's likely you're going to find some woman who's going to think about these things. Uh, you know, for example, I mean, Karen, although she doesn't talk about it very much these days. I mean, I know she shares my interest, Karen Tron, the girl I sweat in, in evolutionary biology and psychology, but this is a grand exception. Uh, you know, she originally, if you remember, sought to understand feminism and. Inevitably, she ended up in, in the Evo Psych, Evo Bio uh, community by default because that's where you're going to find the origins of it. Uh, you know, you can, this, this is why the whole, you know, the Marxist leftist did it uh, really doesn't address it because even if, you're, even if you were to buy that argument, you're still ultimately living, uh, being localized uh, temporally in terms of uh, the present. After all, 150 plus years ago is, is, is proximate. That's not distal ultimate. This will ultimately be, you know, 150,000 years ago. So this is the great challenge. It is the running around like a headless chicken, uh, not even in a position really to do a whole lot of anything to correct these problems because the knowledge is simply lacking, not because it's inaccessible. Like I said, this is not difficult mathematically oriented science. This is the, cha the only challenge of, I feel, of biological and human behavioral science is in, in really understanding and willing to accept what appears to us initially uh, when we first grasp these things, understand these things to be uh, negative, uh, negative outcomes, ne a negative understanding of, of human nature. I mean, it's neither nor, it's neutral. But we can affect change as individuals or collectively without that knowledge. And let me ask you, how many people out there, except a select few MGTOW, not even all MGTOW, are spending their days and nights, you know, looking up human evolutionary biology, behavior, cognition, sitting in a cafe, doing that, taking walks in the park, doing that. I know I do that, but I mean, I admit I'm weird. I'm stardust. I'm a weird guy, and I'm I am I'm a loner. I'm a weird guy. That's what I do with a lot of my time. But I, I can't imagine most people are going to do that. And if they're not willing to do that, uh, it's going to be impossible to take. Uh, steps to correct any of these these problems so quite frankly when say women say these these headless chickens these women against feminism they say well we're against feminism because everyone's equal but they're still living they're still localized in the present they're not talking about how it all came to be they don't understand it and to the addressed now uh, the addressing now many comments uh, about you know, when it when there are women against gynocentrism yeah, well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. When there are women against gynocentrism, women en masse, and maybe people en masse, will be studying these phenomena. But uh, I, I don't see it happening. Uh, I, I don't. Because of the autopilot, because of the headless chicken syndrome. It's just people tend not to do more than they have to. And people, we live in a world, most people live in a world, when they think about cause and effect, they think about it really, as I said, localized in the present in an in approximate way. And that is true of, of almost every lay person. Um, perhaps even c certain people involved in the physical sciences, since a lot of the, what they have to do isn't directly related to human behavior. Uh, it, it's you know, it's going to require basically... Uh, a, a broad spectrum of interest in, in different topics and a willingness to apprehend those topics and, and, and absorb them to get there. And most people aren't, don't have the interest, aren't willing to do it. It's not a criticism per se, but an observation. Uh, you know, I'm thirsty for this knowledge because I think it's the key to changing the fundamentals of human nature, even though I myself will undoubtedly not contribute to that, at least en masse. I can only contribute to myself and perhaps some of my viewers, but uh, this is not this is not the province of most people. Most people are just trying to get by, enjoy themselves, survive, blah 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 blah. This is what we're up against. So this is yeah, and this is why combating feminism without constantly mentioning the deeper seated causes is always almost always going to amount to naught. 
And in the few cases where uh, where you get a, a, you know some sort of reprieve or some sort of uh, uh, concession on the part of a feminist during an argument or what have you, it's likely that she's going to just fall back because people fall back in their ha habits. Remember David Hume, custom. I mean, custom and habit just defi d defines human beings. It's not that you can't break out of it. It's just it's pretty hard. Um, you know, try. Go I mean, this is, once again seems like a bad analogy. It's not. It applies to everything. Uh, try going on a serious diet. I, I mean, a, a diet where you're counting macros and all that, and you know, reducing calories by say 800 calories a day. You're going to notice that, and it's going to be hard to get into it. And you're going to be much more likely to fall back into it. Once it goes on for once it's going on for a couple of weeks, it becomes easier and easier to manage. Just another example: custom and habit. So that's another enemy of the mind. So I don't want to go on too much longer. I've kind of said my piece, and uh, I don't want to ramble too much longer. But th this is, I think, why it's it's nigh, not impossible, but nigh impossible to affect the changes that and, and to, to conquer one's own uh, nature, as it were, because most people aren't in the business of understanding one's nature, at least in the long run, stretching back to the dawn of time. They're interested in understanding immediate cause and effect, proximate causes, and with that, we're going to be lost forever. Anyway, thanks for watching. Appreciate uh, views and comments. Everyone take care. And like I said, soonish, soonish, soonish span of time. Uh, all right. Have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Uh, so I guess I'll just get straight to it. Now, the following quote is from Fido Bogan uh, in regards to why he doesn't um, talk about hypergamy. And so I'll just read off the following quote. Quote, now I too wish to filter in first all human behaviors, which needless to say includes the female kind. However, my take on hypergamy, Briefolt's law and all the rest of that is purely agnostic. I declare no opinion on these matters because I do not claim to know. That is agnosticism for you. So when it comes to filtering out harmful female behaviors, I use a simpler method. Simply stated, I hold women morally accountable, and if they don't measure up, I filter them out. So any harmful behavior that might arise from the dark workings of primitive programming would be cut off at the pass by my system of ethical standards and security clearances. There is a word for this sort of thing, civilization. I should add that this would work for anybody, even if they do believe in hypergamy, etc. Just calibrate your tests and standards according to your theoretical model without talking about your theoretical model, end quote. My question to Fido Bogan is why the agnosticism? I mean, why the claim of not claiming to know when my assessment of these things can in fact be known if one is willing simply to address it fairly? Uh, what me and Stardust have created, in essence, and I'll use the word created loosely since our theories bar borrow heavily from past assessments, people like Schopenhauer, etc. Uh, but, but all me and Stardust have created on, on our channels, respectively, is, as, as Fido Bogan has called it, a predictive model for general female behavior. That's it. Nothing more. Our theories do not and have never been claimed to predict individual female behavior because it's simply not possible to do so. Now, the purpose of agnosticism is to acknowledge the possibility of the existence of something that is untestable, something that we may suspect, but is too enigmatic for us to understand and grasp. And there is nothing, I repeat, nothing enigmatic about female nature. I'm sure many advertising companies construct their entire business models around the exploitation of it. Uh, you know, look at uh, people like Edward Bernays, you know, and, 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 and look up the article about his freedom torches. Uh, many of you will know exactly what I'm talking about when I say freedom torches. Women can be deconstructed uh, down to a science. Their general behaviors can be deconstructed down to a science. Uh, you know, Barack Obama exploits female nature. Joe Biden exploits it. And, and in fact, I'm sure a large amount of their campaign was dedicated completely to understanding and exploiting female nature. It's how they got their votes. You know, even women exploit female nature. Oprah is one of the richest people in the world because she exploited it. Advertising agencies and politicians exploit female nature to extract wealth from men. So it's only fair that men going their own way exploit and understand female nature to keep from having their wealth and happiness taken from them. So in short, uh, you know, I talk about hypergamy and Briefolt's Law because historically it seems that everyone but the average everyday man is clued into female nature and is using it to their advantage. And in a time where women default to their most base biological imperatives after expertly exploiting male nature to justify what can only be described as legal theft of male wealth, divorce being one of a myriad of examples of this, there is nothing 
and I mean absolutely nothing wrong with a bit of reciprocation on the part of men. In short, we are not concerned with the nature of women for any other reason than the fact that male ignorance of it leads to male suffering, misery, and disenfranchisement. We have no interest in faulting women for hypergamy. We have no interest in coaxing women towards repressing it like our traditionalist predecessors. What we want is for men to understand when and how it expresses itself because it is dangerous for them not to. Now this context allows feminism to be viewed as an expression of female biological motives and the rest is simply an exposition of how the state is capitalizing on this. Now we don't see feminism as being some great novel evil that corrupted womankind. And if you do view it this way, you're taking an incredibly simple-minded approach to, to the problems that men and boys face in society. And we don't see feminism as being some great novel evil that corrupted womankind. We see it as being an eventuality of technological advancement and inefficient traditional familial norms that projected what are generally male qualities like familial fidelity and loyalty and all that onto women who were only there for children and protection and provision in the first place, which resulted in feminism. You know, if there was any kind of uh, pre-feminist uh, tinkering, social engineering and, and, and the like, it was minimal, minimal, and it can't even be proven. So there's, there's no point in talking about who made feminism and how it's this great you know evil that has to be extinguished and then everything's going to go back to normal things have radically changed they never will go back to quote unquote normal uh they're not going they're, they're not coming back those days are gone you might as well accept it and join us uh instead of bitching and whining about feminism uh incessantly it's getting old you know i'm tired of talking about feminism and like it's this this it's you know it's it's just getting conspiratorial the fact is there's nothing random about feminism it behaves the way it does, not because of feminists or Marxism or leftists, but because women and men behave the way they do and certain taboos are no longer in play. Since women have categorically refused to not indulge their base biological drives for the benefit of men, I've drawn the conclusion that men should take control of their base biological drives for their own interests. Since male biological imperatives are so interrelated and intertwined with those of women, we must learn to discern when and how these imperatives interact precisely, precisely, so that men have the capability to protect themselves. This isn't about bashing women, this is about protecting men. This is a weapon that we're going to arm ourselves with in light of the attacks that have been leveled against us for the better part of half a century. We're done being beat up, we want to fight back. Hence the need for a comprehensive understanding of hypergamy and all the other associated male or female drives that can be harmful to or exploited against men. We wish the MRA as much success in their goal of reforming marriage laws, but if they fail, men going their own way will have not gotten married in the first place. And why? Well, because we understand that marriage in a historical sense was in many respects nothing more than a repression of female hypergamy. We've seen what happened when these restraints are lifted, and as such, for our own male interests, we will never participate in the institution of marriage again. Now, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make is to assume that if we just make our case logically enough, and, and if we just uh, take extra care to phrase things in a way that cannot be said to be misogynist, that feminists won't still successfully portray us as such. They don't care. They, they, they care nothing about your not giving them the opportunity to call you a misogynist. They actually know you're not one. The people we're up against are the actual misogynists. I mean, they go along with affirmative action for women, for example. Because why? Well, because although they'll never admit it, they believe deep down that women are inferiors. They are the bigots. They're the bigots, and they know it. They don't fluster because you show them through measured rhetoric that you aren't one. Bigots recognize bigots just fine. We don't have to show them that we aren't. Feminist power to exist as bigots is derived from their ability or, or, or rather their social authority to define what a bigot is. And they define it in a way that their bigotry is always beyond scrutiny. And that's why they nestle their bigotry deep into the programmed rhetoric of violence against women and domestic violence and rape. Because once a fetal bogan even broaches the topic of violence against women in any way that doesn't acknowledge feminism's victim narrative, it will put women on the defensive. And furthermore, once they hear you talking about how domestic violence is usually reciprocal and that women are just as violent, if not more violent than men are, you can successfully be branded as misogynist. That's all it takes. So the question I want to ask to men everywhere, and particularly men concerned exclusively with gaining legal equality between men and women, uh, you know, 
or in other words, MRAs, is what evidence do we have to suggest that women even want equality? Because I can show you plenty of evidence to suggest that they don't. And as it stands, feminists offer women privilege, protection, and provision, while all we have to offer is equality with all of its implied loss of privilege. What incentive do women have to choose equality over privilege? That's all we're offering at this point. Remember that. Again, I don't classify feminism as a female supremacism movement. I'm going to say that again. I don't classify feminism as a female supremacism movement. I classify it as a female advocacy at all cost movement, although supremacism most certainly exists within its ranks. But female advocacy is what feminism really is about. Behind the veneer of male hatred and misandry, there is an interconnectedness between women and feminism where the female advocacy for the female vote trade-off functions as feminism's blood-brain barrier. This is why unmarried women in particular back President Obama in the election by a 38% margin. Those type of election demographics don't happen by accident. There must exist huge incentive for record-breaking numbers of women to vote for what is the most feminist president in history in such large numbers. I mean, were the millions of women that voted for President Obama all radical feminists or even feminists at all? No, most were everyday women that simply understood the bottom line, which is if she gives feminists her support politically, they keep her privileges intact. As Stardust refers to them, we can call these women lowercase f feminists. Uh, so saying for the purposes of clarification that feminism is political ideology and women are a gender doesn't really clarify anything for men. Instead, we ought to propose saying that feminism is a massive political female advocacy group that women support in the majority as an actual statement that will help men understand feminism the way it actually exists in the real world. Now, at the very least, this is a statement that I would give to any man who has simply given up working within the system and with women whom I view and many men view as a competing social, political, economic class that will look out for their own interests, regardless of whatever fantasies men have ginned up thinking about what their relation to women is. You know, you can believe in that little fairy tale about men having this special ethereal bond with women, but women are still taking your jobs, they're still taking your uh, spots in education via affirmative action, they're still making more money than you on average, they're still uh, staying employed uh, longer than you on average, they're still receiving more government funding for health benefits than you are as a man, they're still doing all of this, okay? That's not going to change because you have this special little, you know, leave it to beaver mentality. Uh, the reality is that women are competing with men. They are competing special interest group. They are out for themselves. And I don't blame them for it because women should have every right to pursue, you know, their own interests. So long as they don't infringe upon the rights of men. Let me make it clear. I don't want to tell women what to do in any way so long as they are not interfering with the with the fundamental human rights of men from this point on this channel is dedicated to telling men how to manage uh, their expectations of women and society in general to avoid being put through the meat meat grinder but we are not trying to control women uh for the for the same reason that most people have no idea who pens the annual list of new or current groups likely to espouse or engage in terrorism now, i couldn't possibly tell you which terrorist group watch group said it uh, but I know that there's a big push to label the new terrorist threat as being, you know, homegrown or patriots or lone wolves or people who read the Constitution just a little bit too much. And the vast majority of people don't know who said this either. And yet the media is repeating it. And this meme will surely be used to ram some Constitution scrapping post-Patriot Act monstrosity uh, through Congress eventually. Eventually it'll happen. And the meme self-perpetuates and the consequences don't care who said it. This is how things operate in this culture. This is how uh, new ideas are instilled into the public consciousness without their consent. People have figured out a way, uh, the media in general has figured out a way to uh, frame uh, political and public discourse expertly. Um, and, 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 and so if the SPLC labels us as a hate group, uh, that is a very troubling uh, development, I think. Because you see, feminism, like all of the other isms, usually, you know, uh, harmful isms, uh, usually operates on mimetics. You know, its method of propagation is the constant repetition of lies, a constant mimicry of an authority figure's talking points. You know, so and so said one in five women are, you know, etc., etc. It's a reflection of our society's abdication of critical thought to the expert class. 
Uh, the reason that it doesn't matter that many people don't know what the SPLC is, is because it makes no difference in terms of the danger that their classification of men's groups as hate groups poses. It's the same reason why so many lies and so much pseudoscientific drivel is often prefaced by the words experts say, or scientists have found, or the authorities have discovered, etc. In this society, for all intents and purposes, we have now been conflated by the SPLC with white supremacists, or the new Black Panther Party, or the Westboro Baptist Church, and so on, and when the men's movement actually starts to receive television interviews on CNN or other mainstream media outlets, believe me, believe me, the general public will be reminded of it by the media. It'll be a hit piece. You'll see. You'll see what I'm talking about when it happens. It doesn't matter that we're not a hate group at all. Because you see, in, in Oceania, all that matters is that it was said by an authority figure that we are. And the rest is taken care of by female solipsism and her thinking. Now, remember what Winston said about women in George Orwell's 1984. He said, quote, He disliked nearly all women, and especially the young and pretty ones, who were the most bigoted adherents of the party, the squallers of slogans, the amateur spies, and the nosers out of unorthodoxy. End quote. Now this amazing little quote encapsulates our situation perfectly and is the reason why the particular feminists in the Warren Farrell debacle equated MRAs with being, quote, pro-incest and pro-rape. I mean, she knows that women will parrot this. It doesn't matter that it's not true. It matters that she heard it somewhere. Now, can you find misogyny in George Orwell's statement? If you're looking for it, absolutely. And if you look deeper, you notice that there isn't a disgust here for any inherent femaleness but towards the oppressive behaviors they exhibit and the destructive memes they perpetuate and that, my MRA friends, is a source of feminism's power whether it sounds misogynist or not. The question, I think, is um, what should the consequences be? Well, I'm not so naive as to think that the entire female gender bears any, any total responsibility for feminism. Uh, I've never said that, never will. I do not make such an indictment. But I do believe that it is time for a fundamental shift in how men view women. Now, some have inaccurately referred to this suggestion as me claiming that women have a fundamentally mercenary nature or an insurmountably flawed nature. But I, I suggest you hear what I call it from my mouth instead of taking the word of others in regards to what I have said. I do not claim that we view women as having mercenary or flawed nature but as simply having an incompatible nature for the traditionalist setup that existed before feminism. And this is what is categorically important for men to understand and, re and retain for whatever it is we put in place after feminism. It isn't about hating women, but dispelling our current understanding of them. To put it as simply as possible, we don't hate women, but we do understand them. And we want as many men as possible to understand them as well. And understand that men have been lied to about the way women see them and the way women are. We've been told essentially that lead cups are optimal for drinking out of. And the fact that we know that believing this about lead will result in us poisoning ourselves doesn't mean that we hate lead. We just know that while lead is used for many things, it sure is a terrible tool for making cups to drink out of. So no more lies about marriage and love and romance. Men and women are not lovers. We fuck, we make babies, and we set up all sorts of customs and traditions around that. And oftentimes the traditions become so thoroughly ensconced for so long that we forget why they're even there. And when we forget why they're there in the first place, we can, we can no longer judge whether or not they're still useful at any given point in time. And that is what happened with traditionalism. We created the lies of romantic love and chivalry and traditionalism because men needed to believe in women being with him because they loved them instead of because they needed them. And when women figured out that they no longer needed men, that they could work for themselves or rely on government to extract wealth from men, that little fantasy was shattered into a billion pieces. I like to call it uh, the, the feminist DMT trip. Um, never taken any psychedelics, but any of you that have probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, DMT, uh, dimethyltryptyline, is a chemical uh, that, that, that takes you on a, on, on a rapid trip, uh, the onset of which occurs literally uh, seconds after the consumption of the drug, and it takes you to what, what has been described as a completely different reality. And that's what the collapse of traditionalism did. 
it, it rushed us. It, it catapulted men rather unwillingly to a position exactly one half of the, dis, of the distance to true reality, a true view of women and how they see us. Now, the rest is up to us. The rest is up to us and whether or not we want to really see it. So the next decade or two will be quite interesting to see how things really uh, unfold. We'll see what happens. That's all I got to say for now. Thank you for listening. Greetings all. I thought I'd add my own two cents to this uh, discussion about women against feminism, although Barbara also really said the vast majority of what I would have said. Um, I don't normally mention specific names of subscribers, but I have this subscriber named Matchbox555. It's not the first time he's done it. He writes direct messages to me demanding I make, I, I make his videos. He says, where's my new video? Now, Mr. Matchbox555, you're incredibly irksome, uh, not least of which for the f uh, reason that you consistently uh, miswrite my name. My name is Star Dusk with a K. That is a voiceless velar plosive, in case you uh, can't distinguish between that, and a uh, alveolar voiceless uh, uh, plosive T. You said star dust. My name is not star dust. It is star dusk. Remember that. Voiceless velar plosive, not a voiceless alveolar uh, plosive. And there are two different things. So get that straight. And yes, uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't owe you videos. You have no proprietary rights over my videos. I appreciate my subscribers and I appreciate uh, the fact that they appreciate uh, the work I put into my videos, but I don't owe you specifically when you use that manner of uh, speech and of course misaddress me as well using my the, the name that I don't go by. I don't owe you anything. So um, there will be a video out, but I'm not making it for you, rest assured. And if you continue this, I'll just block you because you're extremely irksome. Anyway, just want to get that out of the way. What do I think about the whole you know, women against feminism? Barbara also really summed it up pretty well. I think the same thing as he does, more or less. But I also want to add uh, my own statement. Who cares? By and large, I think feminism on this channel, on Barbara's channel, and in general throughout the manosphere has been sufficiently dissected, sufficiently discussed. If we were to look at feminism as a uh, an object uh, of matter, you know, we could talk about, we've talked about its molecular structure, its atomic structure, we've talked about its uh, closer to chemistry, its chemical structure, uh, in terms of uh, its uh, biolog biological applications of this matter, we've talked about uh, the way it, it works uh, with, as a, within the uh, organism of society, I mean, we've really talked about feminism to death. And constant, we, we don't need to talk about it very much anymore, unless it's directly relevant to something, and sometimes reinforcement of points and uh, arguments made in the past is, is useful, but I don't, think, I don't think it's really that useful here. So, yeah, who cares? My only concern with regards to these anti-feminist women is that people who actually still bother arguing with these silly feminists. And one point I should add is the one, another reason not to bother arguing with feminists is it's a waste of time precisely because they're not the kinds of people who are amenable to reason, logic, rational argument. They're, they're, the entire premise of their worldview is a giant illusion. It's a, a type of religion. What, what's the sense in arguing with, uh, with religionists of great conviction? Not much. But my only worry is that people who call themselves anti-feminist, MRAs, people who actually believe feminism is some is not a is some sort of primary phenomenon as opposed to an epiphenomenon uh, regarding female human behavior and what have you, that they're going to get in bed with these women. We all know what these women want, as Barbarossa said uh, quite clearly, and I agree with him. Uh, they want to go back to the good old days. They want their free rides, and they know that. Modern feminism, its current state is, is fairly moribund. It's not going anywhere, and rather fast. And so they're noticing, they're picking up on it, and they want to live the good life. And these aren't the kinds of people one uh, should ally oneself with, in my opinion. Uh, of course, anti-feminists might disagree, but yeah, for the most part, who cares? My interest as an individual on this channel is studying human behavior in the wider perspective, and that leads me to uh, me 
hopefully quickly answering a question that was posed to me by a female. I don't know if she's a subscriber of mine. She asked me, Stardusk, remember? Voiceless, Velar Plosive. Uh, do you hate women? Uh, no, I don't. I don't hate women. I've been asked this many times, of course. I don't hate women, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent to them. Not in the sense that I don't indifferent that I have just no interest in making any commentary on them, otherwise this channel to some extent wouldn't exist. But in the same sense that I study you know, the behavioral patterns of wolves, since I've always been interested in zoology, or the hunting patterns of Amur or Siberian tigers, so too do I study the behavioral patterns of women, men, human, the human ape. I, these, this, women are certainly not the object of my hatred. I don't care enough about women to hate them. Uh, I'm, yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't care enough about women to hate them. It's a waste. Hate is a waste of energy. There are very few things I hate in this world. So no, I don't hate women. I look at them as an object of study as I do pretty much everything in life. Um, they're just an object of study that come up uh, quite often because they're relevant to the makeup of society and how societies run and all that mumbo jumbo and jazz. Anyway, so thought I'd just add that and explain that and yeah so this women against feminism who cares we know what feminism is it's been sufficiently dissected we know what these kinds of these traditionalist women represent we know that they're just you know two sides of the same coin uh don't get caught unawares still i mean who cares at least on this channel i and those of you interested in the material i produce we're interested in, in dissecting the human animal in its totality rather than some but i think ultimately is a is a is a minor to middle-sized epiphenomenon that we call feminism. So have a nice day, afternoon or evening, depending on your location. And as I said, there should be a video out in a relatively soonish span of time. And remember, Matchbox 555, voiceless velar plosive. Hmm? Bye. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to... Uh talk real quick about the uh, recent events that are going on uh, in relation to the, sh the shooting, the mass shooting that took place in Connecticut. Uh, but primarily this, this, uh, this discussion is going to be more about uh, men and how they protect themselves. Now, uh, we've talked uh, extensively about this, uh, this societal expectation of men uh, that is quite clearly uh, that, that we have in society that's quite clearly there for men to protect women and children, you know, from all the evil men there are in the world and so on and so forth, you know, such as our gender mandate. And it is and it is through this gender mandate that every form of male neglect from, you know, withholding government funding for victims of male domestic violence to the trivialization and ridicule of male rape derives from. So we're going to talk about this uh, uh, briefly here now. Well, let me start by saying that, you know, if, if you failed as a man to not be raped, uh, you know, you are a man that by definition cannot protect women and children. Uh, you are a failure according to a society that labels men as the default protectors of women and children. And, and if you're a victim of domestic violence at the hands of a woman, you most certainly cannot protect women and children, and the same male failure to protect applies. And so it's this uh, cultural attitude that makes it so that, you know, blue pill white knights especially are, are willing to throw themselves in front of danger for women they don't even know, because they believe that they're fulfilling their mandate to protect women. And, you know, this type of psychology is so ingrained in men that even an off-duty cop, well, I'm going to play for you the, uh, the video. Uh, the famous ABC video where uh, a woman was abusing a man and an off-duty cop walked right past him and didn't do anything. It wasn't revealed that he was an off-duty cop till after they confronted him and interviewed him. But I, I just want you to see uh, the cop's commentary after he was confronted for not protecting this man that was, uh, that was being attacked right in front of his face, essentially assaulted uh, by his, his significant other girlfriend. But what would a cop do when a woman is abusing a man? Self-centered. Ah. Hi, guys. Why not call 911? Uh, what they would have it, they would just have a little tiff. It'd be alright. I find it upsetting. I would find it more upsetting if he were putting his hands on her. If you're wondering why they didn't call 911, well, he's a cop. If it had been the man, oh, without a doubt, you would have stepped in. Yeah. That's the old, called old-fashioned views. It's, called, a, it's a double it, standard. It is. What can I tell you? I mean, you know, if you're raised the way I was raised, you don't put your hands on them. Right? So basically, you know, I, I wanted to show you that video because I wanted to emphasize the point that a, a, a an off-duty cop 
in direct view of, of a physically violent domestic dispute can choose to ignore it based merely on the fact that the person being abused is male. And this is in a time where, you know, every every major police department in every major American city has, I'm sure, a, a, a robust public relations department designed to paint themselves in an acceptable light to the people they are paid to protect and serve. Meaning that all major police departments in America understand that they can only get away with what the people will let them, or at the very least, they must adhere to this perception as much as possible. And this perception states that an off-duty cop could not get away with saying after passing by someone who was black, for example, in a similar situation that, you know, well, uh, call it old fashioned. It was how I was raised. And, you know, now if it was a black guy attacking a white person, then I would definitely step in to stop it. If an off duty cop were to say this, I mean, it would be a PR disaster for the uh, department that he belonged to. Uh, the cop would most likely be suspended without pay or even fired. Now, now, I'm not implying that racism is not or cannot be ingrained in many aspects of Western society. I'm sure it is, but I can prove to you, or, or at least I have proved to you just now, that certain discriminations pertaining to the male gender are much more so ingrained to the point of invisibility. Because a police officer can in fact say the same statement by replacing black and white with man and women, which yields the quote, well, you know, call it old fashioned, it was how I was raised, now if it was a man attacking a woman, I would definitely step in to stop it. And that flies, that's okay. So my point in showing you this is that it, it speaks volumes that while men specifically pay the most taxes out of any demographic, that a police officer paid to protect and serve the citizenry by tax dollars can refuse to provide that protection on the basis of the person needing that protection being a member of the male gender. The conclusion that we must draw when men whom are vulnerable are ignored by the very people our society pays to protect us is that men are on their own when it comes to protecting themselves. Nobody, not even the police, are willing to protect men. We are responsible for it ourselves. And this is where I want to bring up uh, the Second Amendment, which we all know is being uh, hotly debated uh, in response to the uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. You see, the, the Second Amendment isn't simply about hunting or protecting ourselves in the event that it becomes necessary to overthrow a tyrannical government. It's much, much more to men. Uh, the, the Second Amendment is, is, is a significant avenue for proactive male self-preservation and protection. Men don't have other people willing to jump in front of violence to protect us, as you've just seen. Even the cops themselves, who are supposed to adhere to a sworn duty to protect all citizens, will refuse to do it, and women certainly aren't willing, and of course children can't. The right to bear arms, then, is a mechanism for male independence and freedom that men should be uniquely aware of and in support of, in my honest opinion. And those that seek to control guns and to take them away uh, from the general citizenry and men in general are either directly or indirectly seeking to control men and placing men's safety and security under threat. Now, it's common knowledge that men are almost three times more likely to become a victim of violent crime. We simply cannot afford to take the one surefire method of protection that men have left away from them. And as such, I am not, absolutely not, a supporter of gun control, period. Which brings us to the Sandy Hook Elementary shooting. Now, I'm going to say as little as possible about the shooting itself, other than the fact that uh, I'm of the opinion that visiting any harm onto children whatsoever is possibly the worst crime you can commit in this world. I mean, it just, it's just off limits. You do not harm children. And so, you know, that, that should speak volumes about what it is I feel towards someone that would shoot up an elementary school. But that's all I'm going to say about it. You know, I'm not going to make my contribution to the thoroughly repulsive, artificially compassionate uh, one-upsmanship Olympics we see the media engaging in, where, you know, every single political pundit and personality has to make sure you know just how much he or she feels the pain of the loss of every single child and victim of this school shooting. You know, it's almost as if they're trying to convince us of something they don't believe in. You know, because, of course, uh, everybody knows that uh, we're drone striking all sorts of, you know, schools and, 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 and weddings half a world away, uh, essentially on a, almost probably on a daily basis. And nobody's saying anything then. Um, but, you know, I'm getting off topic now. The actual aspect of the media's reaction that actually worries me uh, is, is this current push for gun control uh, that they're leveling, which is probably the most fervent I've ever seen. And it's pushed by these same hypocrites that are penning these, you know, toxic wayward masculinity as the cause of mass murder and school shootings narratives. Uh, notice that if a man or a teenager boy embarks on a shooting spree, 
especially ones such as the Connecticut shooting where innocent young children were targeted and murdered. We blame video games and the Second Amendment and violence in Hollywood. You know, we blame a myriad of things that normal people use every day, ranging from, you know, for purposes ranging from self-defense to entertainment. But more importantly, we blame maleness itself. You know, the very act of existing as a male is pathologized for the actions of a handful of very disturbed psychopathic individuals, which happen to be male. But you know what's interesting is that, you know, when Andrea Yates uh, killed her seven, five, three, and two-year-olds, as well as her six-month-old, what did we see then? You know, or more importantly, what did we not see? Uh, we didn't see any talk of qualities inherent to the feminine to explain the murders of innocent children. And in fact, we, we bent over backwards to explain it away, you know, postpartum depression and whatnot. And, you know, we continue to do this. We go out of our way to infer that the women who do this, the women who kill their own children, for example, and, and this is a woman who killed five children, you know, so it's not that far off from the 20 children that, that this gentleman killed. And we go out of our way to infer that the women who did this, you know, deviated from the inherent nonviolentness of female kind due to some, you know, chemical imbalance or whatever other excuse we can find. Essentially, we live in a society where an act of mass murder perpetrated by a male is an indictment of masculinity, while an act of mass murder committed by a woman is an anomaly of female kind, and yet the facts show that when it comes to which gender is more likely to kill children, it is women, not men, doing this in the majority. Uh, I've read articles in the Huffington Post even, you know, a feminist screed, you know, where it says that women kill over 100 of their own children every year. You know, that's more than a Columbine, Virginia Tech, and Sandy Hook Elementary combined, just to put it in perspective. And, and nobody that I've seen when, this, when these things happen uh, ha has, has inferred that the fundamental rights of women be breached because women are somehow more prone to violence against children. You know, we don't blame female kind for the likes of Andrea Yates, and I'll not sit here and tolerate a bunch of self-loathing, bigoted women and liberal proselytizers telling us that the blame for Adam Lanza or Dylan Klebold or whatever psychopaths currently holds their fancy lies on masculinity and manhood. As you know, on this channel, uh, I encourage men to reject the left-right political binary and just assess things as they are and judge them for themselves. And the fact is that no matter how many school shootings there are, no matter how many Adam Lanzas uh, there are, you as a man are still 100% responsible for your own protection. And if someone threatens you with violence, you have the option of either having a firearm for self-defense or not. That's all there is to it. That's the only decision you have to make in terms of the gun control debate. That's it. And lastly, you know, let, let's talk about mental health for a second. You know, th there's all this talk about how we need better methods of identifying these mental illnesses before these boys slip through the cracks and all this talk about identifying the warning signs and so on. Maybe we should ask ourselves why, if this is such a male problem, why is it that as you analyze the distribution of gender among our nation's educators, we notice that the younger boys are, the more likely they are to be surrounded in majority by female teachers who quite frankly don't understand their needs and how they develop to the point that they would rather administer all sorts of medications like Ritalin after they've pathologized normal boy behavior at that point at that stage in development as a disease, ADHD or what have you. I mean, what is it exactly that these people actually know about the normal development of a boy's mental health when they've done nothing to try to understand it and have actually tried to medicate it away with drugs that prevent the reuptake of serotonin in a, in, in a boy's brain, in a human's brain? What do they know about male mental health? If they actually had a real interest in the development of mental illness in boys, perhaps they would have male teachers teaching them at critical ages of their development, and perhaps they would actually embrace the differences that boys exhibit in the learning process that helps them learn and develop properly instead of trying to force them into learning the way girls do. These people have zero interest in asking themselves what makes boys tick, and if, we, and if it weren't for the occasional school shooting, they would never ask the question in the first place. And that's all I really have to say about that. Hi, today I want to talk a little bit about Briefo's Law, something I think that every man should know about, extremely, extremely important, and um, much of the information you can just find on a basically one page worth uh, of a website I'm posting. It's very, very informative. It's very concise. Um, all the information is there. I'm probably just going to expand a little bit on it, and I have no illusions that I'm going to add a tremendous amount to it, but I think by posting a video that's actually talking specifically about this, it could be helpful. And as I said, 
uh, all men should know about it. It's uh, probably when dealing with women, the single most important thing you can know is a man. So uh, that's why I'm going I'm to delve into this a bit. Now, uh, as you can see on the website, Briefall was a uh, late 19th century, uh, early mid 20th century guy who uh, was primarily a novelist, but he, as well as a, a surgeon, a medical doctor. But he also engaged in things like social anthropology and uh, writing on sociology in general. And um, he famously said, well, famously, I don't know how famous it is, to be quite honest, but he did say that Briefo's law states quite, I'll read it out loud right off the website, the female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family. Where the female can derive no benefit from associ association with the male, no such association takes place. And um, the guy who runs the blog has added some very, very nice corollaries, in my opinion. One, corollary one, Past benefit provided by the male does not provide for continued or future association. Corollary two, any agreement where the male provides a current benefit in return for a promise of future association is null and void as soon as the male has provided the benefit. See corollary one. Three, a promise of future benefit has limited influence on current slash future association with the influence inversely proportionate to the length of time until the benefit will be given and directly proportionate to the degree to which the female trusts the male. Um, and then in brackets, which is not bloody likely. This is really important. I'm going to talk a little about these corollaries the guy has come up with. Well, pa past benefit provided by the male does not provide for continued or future association. It's very important. Um, in my previous video and a few other times, you know, we talked about honor being primarily the province of the male. Well, this would be a uh, good illustration of that, in my opinion, because... Um, we as men have a uh, concept of commitment of debt. If someone, even if I don't like the person, if someone does something for me, I do feel in some sense obligated to discharge, at the very least discharge that debt. The female uh, feels no such compunction. That means that even if a male has provided for her well-being for 10 years, um, and for whatever reasons, perhaps he falls ill or he has an injury, or it doesn't matter what the reasons are, although certainly being ill and injured is a good reason, would be a logical reason, um, and sure to elicit no sympathy or empathy on the part of the female that side, she won't, um, she will not continue her association with it. Why? Because he's no longer providing the benefit. So th that's a, I think corollary one probably is the most important one to stress, that this idea that just because you've taken care of or you've been nice or kind to your partner or woman doesn't mean she's going to regard that as a, uh, a, uh, worthwhile thing in, in, in terms of discharging debt or in terms of uh, paying you back, in terms of kindness or whatever. Of course, the irony is how often do we hear, oh, I gave them the best years of my life. And so women do have that expectation, despite themselves not practicing it. Um, agreement number two, uh, so that's past benefit provided by the male, does not provide for continued or future association. Corollary two, any agreement where the male provides a current benefit in return for a promise of future association is null and void as soon as the male has provided the benefit, which is essentially a reinforcement of one. He says it himself. That's right. So if you are providing a current benefit with the expectation that um, that you'll be treated well or get whatever it is you, you might desire from the one most likely sex, um, access to the vagina in, in the future because you're, do, you're providing a service or a benefit now, um, there is no connection between the two. They don't, they don't link up, unfortunately. Um, you need to continue providing that benefit, in theory, indefinitely, although you know, it's another issue. And finally, three, a promise of future benefit has limited influence on current future association with the influence inversely proportionate to the length of time until benefit will be given and directly proportionate to the degree to which the female trusts the male. Somewhat more complicated. Um, so what he's saying here is that A woman who sees a potential benefit in the future will act only to a limited uh, extent uh, based on her own perception of how, how, how much that benefit is within reach um, and how much she quote unquote trusts the male. So, I mean, I'm not going to give a specific uh, temporal indication, but so let, let's say if, if, if a woman sees a benefit six months down the line, that might be a worthwhile investment of her time and energy. However, if the benefit is six years down the line, it might not be. Now, on the other hand, if it's look, if she's looking at you know, say on ten million dollars, 
um, what I mean, the famous Kobe Bryant's uh, not 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 really a tangent. The story, apparently, from what I heard. Um, I'm not a huge basketball fan or math sports fan in general, but is that um, the the wife stuck around the husband on, on the advice of the mother primarily for the purpose of being able to uh, rake it in during the divorce. Um, the, the, mo the mother advised the daughter to maintain the relationship slash marriage um, in order to uh, garner his wealth. So that would be sort of a long-term projection of association for the sake of benefit. Um, so that's all relative, from, uh, based on the perspective of the uh, of a female who's choosing to associate with the male. Um, and you know, Briefall is right in talking about the animal family. We are animals, and, and we see it time and time again. Females choose the lion. Male peacocks look ridiculous and put themselves in danger and uh, in danger and uh, in order to attract females and so on and so forth. But the woman, the female chooses. There's some more very interesting information about the uh, idea that Thai women are different. And the main point of this guy's summary is that um, w women are universal in their adherence to Brifo's law. Where Brifo's law uh, does differ, it's only in the degrees, the specific degrees which an individual woman, and women are actually individuals, I've never denied that, will display this behavior. So it's quite possible, I will concede that, that Brifo's law um, is, I'm just going to make up some percentages, there's only 10% in effect in one woman, and then 95% in another, and 100 in another, and so on and so forth. But rest assured, and do not doubt, that a woman will only associate with a male based on the benefit she potentially sees in him. Um, and I'll talk about those specific, specific benefits in a bit. Um, but he goes on to, to stress that uh, all women associate with any man only so long as they derive uh, benefit from the association, this cannot be stated too many times. Um, and he goes on to mention some statistics in the UK regarding hypergamy. Um, and you can read this all for yourself. I don't want to talk too much about that. Uh, kind of funny, the guy apparently married four times. And he has a sense of humor. He says, marriage number four, so I'm a slow learner. But the point he's trying to make, and I'm trying to make, is that um, the, 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 the benefit issue is the most important thing. He also talks about things we've talked about recently. Uh, he talks about, you know, he says, loyalty, honor, gratitude, and duty are male values that we men project on women, but which very few to know women actually possess. We, we, differ, uh, we differ slightly. He thinks it's drummed into us by society and culture. I think it's inherent to us and accelerated and exacerbated by society. Um, and women, I mean, I think one of my posters, uh, I forgot his name and you'll forgive me, uh, I used to read a fair bit of Schopenhauer, and Schopenhauer did, in fact, say that women are there for the species. They, they do not value individual lives, and uh, you know, so that, that does make sense. Uh, the, he also goes on to say, so do not expect that the woman in your life will be grateful and sacrifice for you when you can no longer provide for her and hers. And make no mistake, you, will never, you have never been and never will be part of what is hers. What are hers will be her, first herself, then her biological children, then her parents, then her siblings, and then the rest of her blood relatives. The biological imperative has always been to extend her bloodline. It stops there and it always will. This is true everywhere in the world. Get over it. This is this can be saddening, and indeed it is, to me at least. Um, but these are the facts, unfortunately. That is how the female operates. I want to talk a little about this concept of benefit, because uh, inevitably, men will get involved with, in relationships. Not everyone is a man going his own way, and not everyone has either temporarily, in my case, or uh, permanently renounced uh, the relationship as a concept. But the problem, the problem people think benefit, they immediately think money. And certainly that would be a very tangible, very uh, solid way of looking at the exchange of goods, right? Because a relationship, according to Brifo's law, and you don't even need that to see that, is simply a business transaction. Most of the time, the man is paying for uh, sex and, and perhaps access to um, reproduction in exchange for his financial uh, resources, money, um, things he can buy, and level of comfort provided to the woman. But it can be a lot more subtle. Um, and this is something that men need to be aware of. So, for example, uh, Bob, imaginary man, is in a relationship, and he, the, the woman doesn't seem to be particularly interested in the, uh, the money he may or may not have. Let's say he doesn't have a lot of money. So, you know, she's not interested in my money. She's a good woman. 
there, there is something else going on. There might be some other benefit. Who knows? It could be really anything. He might have a huge cock. She might, she might enjoy the sex with him. She might simply enjoy the attention. This is very common. Lavished upon her by Bob. She might enjoy his servitude, his willingness to um, essentially uh, get down on the knees and, uh, and take it up the ass, uh, metaphorically speaking. So there are a lot of ways to interpret benefit. Benefit does need not necessarily be just money. Uh, that should be clear. And it's, it's often, um, I mentioned this, and I want to stress this, because so many men are willing to overlook that. Oh, she's not into my money, so she's not a superficial or person or what have you. At the end of the day, she will, she will be looking for some kind of benefit. In some ways, the financial transaction benefit is the most transparent and the easiest to deal with. Um, if, you, if, if, men, if a man chooses to enter into a relationship with a woman, and it's very clear cut what the um, st well, what's stipulated in the contract. Whether I mean, obviously it's not officially signed, but it's a business transaction, the business contract, and and the, the primarily the, the primary stipulation is one of financial services. Then that's pretty uh, cut and uh, cut and dry. If it's more something like some sort of emotional, vague, vague emotional feeling that you're giving to the female, or the way you know you she might enjoy sex with you, or maybe it's even you know the artwork she that you know that she enjoys that you produce. At some point in time, she won't like it anymore, so the benefit ends. Um, finally, in some cases, in my observation, also from my own relationships, I've never been wealthy, so that's never been the uh, primary benefit-seeking uh, issue in terms of the women I've dated. Not only the women just don't know specifically, but rest assured they are looking for some kind of benefit, um, and they will cancel the relationship as soon as they have the feeling, however vague it might be, that whatever benefit they may or may not have been cognizant of uh, has uh, ceased to be. Just wanted to get that out there. That's very important. So we, to not always um, assume benefit is financial. Oftentimes it is. So I'm not going to give people advice. I don't do that. Uh, Al Pacino's character, a.k.a. Satan in, uh, the, in Devil's Advocate, which I think is quite a good film, very well done, um, highly underrated, quite famously said, you know, the worst advice is advice. But what I would suggest, what I think might be wise, is if a man chooses to enter into a relationship, or a, well, let's just say relationship, marriage is, you know, we know what marriage is about, then um, the man should, prior to entering the relationship, be aware of what the benefit is to the female. Once again, if it's cut and dry, if it's just an issue of finances, let's say the man has money, then it's, it's pretty clear what the female is, is, uh, is looking for. Um, and consequently, as long as he can provide for her financially, he'll have uh, continued, most likely continued access to her vagina or whatever else he might seek from her. Much more dangerous it is for, 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 for men who perhaps are not wealthy or at least hide their wealth because the, the female will be looking for something else. And it really can range from anything. I mean, it could be the cool pictures you draw, your writings, um, your servitude, the slavish attention you lavish on her. Um, maybe you're an amazing cook. I actually, it sounds odd. I actually knew a guy who had a relationship with a uh, with a female, and she would constantly praise him. He was a very, very talented cook. Um, he wasn't a professional, but I mean, he could have easily been. Just I mean, he's very good. I tasted his food. Very good. She was together. I mean, I, I together with him for uh, the cooking, pretty much. She eventually dumped him for a man with more money. So th there's another uh, thing at play that. Sometimes one benefit will outweigh the other. So the cooking was really good, but the, the other man's money was better. Um, that's another issue that, that, that's important to stress, that in some cases, um, one benefit seen in one man outweighs the other, um, or it could be a combination of benefits. Remember, women are always looking for one leg up. They're looking for a way to uh, improve their situations. And so they will take, they will, if they see a man who can provide a better benefit, rest assured you will be chucked out the door, out the window. There's no doubt about that. Um, you're, you, I, this cannot be stressed enough, and I apologize if it's repetitive. Remember, you have no humanity, no personhood in the eyes of a woman. You are merely a tool. You are merely a utility. That is your only purpose, is to serve uh, her interests. And she is willing to give you sex in return, um, perhaps some mother, some feigned motherly uh, sense of comfort at, at, at best. Um, but all those quote unquote gifts, or rather the services rendered for the contract, will cease to be uh, once she finds someone else who can provide a better benefit. Or as in a previous video I talked about, she finds someone uh, who can.
provide one benefit whilst maintaining the benefit with you. So maybe you are a great cook and a quote unquote loving nice guy, but she found some guy with a huge cock that she who's, that she loves to sex with. So she'll 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 pool her resources there and enjoy both. Uh, maybe she'll even cuckle. Maybe she'll have children with that guy, and you take care of him because you're the good cook and you're the good father. Potentially, if you're not a father, but you see my point. <laughs> this is very important. Um, so. The thing that needs to be stressed over and over and over again is that a relationship with a woman is nothing else than a business contract, a, a transaction. Um, you will provide a service, a benefit, and usually it's much greater. The, 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 the level of uh, the proportion of services rendered by the man tends to be much greater than what the woman gives back because most of the time the woman simply spreads her legs. That's the service that she renders. That, um, you know, once again, commensurate compensation. It's almost never commensurate compensation. So that's something to really, uh, that's food for thought. Um, but Brevo's law needs to be uh, borne in mind by every every man, every man walking on the earth. Because regardless of the degree of the manifestation of Brevo's law in female behavior, it will always be there. And yes, some women, there are some women with a, with a shred of conscience. And those might be women with maybe slightly less uh, of a tendency to live out Brefo's law, but that will always be there. Um, I, I'll give credit, for example, to my last ex, uh, who admitted to me that she cheated and, and felt rather bad about it. Um, she's also very young, mind you. She's 23 now. Um, but it, it just goes to show that uh, when the benefit is no longer there, they, they will jettison you. And I think as, as she gets older, as is my prediction, I don't have contact with her anymore, which is good thing. She, she will uh, you know, throw off uh, the last shreds of ethics and what have you, and she will fully evolve into someone who's much more uh, likely to adhere to all of the tenets of, or the, all of the content of Brefo's law. Just a matter of time, really. But, um, no, that's pretty much what I had to say. It's, 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 and, and, of course, he's mentioned the article that there are no exceptions. Yes, culture can mitigate certain things, and um, so, for example, culture can can extend or can increase the the extent of of, of how much Brefo's law weighs in on a female or lessen that, but that will always be there. Um, and culturally, let's just look at the United States. I mean, this is Brefo's law run mad. I, I don't think the women here are running a hundred percent here. I'm not in the states where, where I was. Are running a hundred percent of Brefo's law? I think they're running. 120 percent. I'm being generous. Um, you might have another culture, Korean culture, where it might only be 50 or 70 percent because there are some constraints uh, placed on the women to, to a certain extent. And uh, so I urge my viewers and anyone else who might come across this to just really familiarize yourself with Brefo's Law. It's, very, it's, it's the single most important thing you can read about women or learn about women. And remember, if you choose to enter into some kind of relationship, be it a marriage or a normal relationship, quote unquote normal relationship, be very aware of the benefits you are providing to her. If the benefits are more concrete, well, uh, that's that's easier in a lot of ways, more transparent. If they're vague and nebulous, that's going to be a lot uh, trickier. Um, and always be aware that a woman will ditch you uh, near, nearly uh, in a moment's, at a moment's notice if she sees someone who can either provide more benefit of the same or multiple benefits, um, which of course would out outstrip the benefits you provide that you provide to her. And um, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. But it's very, very familiar that we all familiarize, our, uh, very important that we all familiarize ourselves with uh, Brefo's Law. Very, very important. And I, and I hope other uh, MRAs and men going their own way mention this. It's very, 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 very important. Cannot stress this enough. Thanks for watching.